This is a special Indigenous Peoples edition of the Global News Podcast from the BBC World Service. I'm Peter Goffin. And I'm Iona Hampson. Together, we'll guide you through this exploration of Indigenous and tribal life around the world. There are thousands of Indigenous cultures, each with their own unique history and experience. No single person or story could ever speak for all of them, and we are not going to try. But for all their differences, there is also a common thread. Most Indigenous peoples have been marginalised and persecuted by colonialism, imperialism and the modern governments that evolved out of those systems. In some of the most developed countries on Earth, Indigenous people continue to experience lower rates of health, education, employment and housing, and higher rates of violence and discrimination. This special edition of the Global News Podcast will confront many of those challenges. But most of all, it will shine a spotlight on some of the Indigenous leaders and activists, artists and academics who are working for change while trying to preserve their culture and coexist equally alongside other communities. We'll meet one of the Indigenous groups defending the Amazon rainforest from illegal loggers. I've received messages directly from the illegal loggers and also from local politicians who have sent me messages telling me that I could be killed any minute. But this is the work that I've got to do. And speak to the people aiming to build Canada's largest urban reserve. To South Africa, where the racist apartheid classification system is impacting Indigenous communities. And of course... I'm a Daki Yapi. Hello, relatives. My name is Chelsea. My name is Tisa. My name is Murphy. Papibo. Hello, my name is Samuel. My name is Lance. I'm Bunny Sings Wolf. We'll hear from you, our global podcast listeners. Monday, the 10th of October, marks Indigenous Peoples Day in the US. It's a chance to honour the cultures and contributions of Native Americans, but it's also a corrective. For decades, this has been Columbus Day celebrating one of the first and most famous European colonisers to arrive in the Americas. But the legacy of Christopher Columbus, who oversaw the murder and enslavement of Indigenous people, has led to a growing number of states and cities celebrating the country's original inhabitants instead. Last year, Joe Biden became the first sitting US president to mark the day, and he committed to supporting what he called a new, brighter future of promise and equality for tribal nations. One year on, we asked our Indigenous listeners in the US what issues matter most to them. Papibo. Hello, my name is Samuel and I'm from the Pueblo of Pauaki, or as we call it in our Tewa language, Posunwage Owinge, meaning water drinking place village. I think one of the crucial issues that the wider public should be aware of and work to support is that of Indigenous language revitalization efforts. Our language uh, is the blueprint to our ability to live in the way our ancestors did that allowed them to be in the same place for thousand plus years and to live in a way that only brought prosperity to their children and took care of the earth. Our indigenous languages will allow us to reestablish our relationships with the land, both native and non-native. Kudawa. Thank you. I'm a Dakiyapi. Hello, relatives. My name is Chelsea Luger, and I am a wellness advocate and an author, originally from the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa and the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. Post-colonial impacts continue to cause health disparities in Indigenous communities around the world. We suffer from high rates of diabetes, depression, suicide, accidental death, and myriad other issues that are all tied back to some of the challenges that we've faced in our history. I think that the wellness industry in modern times has not included indigenous voices or wisdom, but that's something that we are trying to change. There's a big social media presence of those who are attempting to decolonize health and wellness. We are incorporating our culture and our teachings into programming, and ideas and discussions that give our youth and our people ideas on how to reclaim our health and our well-being. Hello, my name is Lance, and I identify as Indigenous and as a member of the Navajo tribe. A challenge in my life has been finding a sense of identity and finding appropriate avenues of expressing and celebrating my cultural heritage. Changes that I'd like to see for the future 
a world in which past discrimination has been rectified enough to allow for a true merit-based society, and additionally, a world in which indigenous populations that have been marginalized can be fully restored and reintegrated. I'm Bunny Sings Wolf of the spiritual traditional family and nation of Lakota, Dakota, Nakota Nation. I live in the Wyoming Black Hills near a place that we call Atotipala, the home of strong bear medicine, home of bear, home of healing, and the tree of life. Surely you must know all humans are indigenous to Mother Earth. We are a global family with the same Mother Earth and Father Sky. We are all children of the life-giving soil, born from the dust as relatives with all life. We are the only species with capabilities to be stewards, caretakers of life, and yet so far we are failing miserably. Our individual healing, purpose, sovereignty, freedom, and strength will only come when we consciously seek to learn how best we can individually create the needed impact to awaken the world to life-nurturing ways to honor the greatest of all things we have in common, life in oneness with all its glorious diversity. The United Nations has estimated that there are more than 475 million people across dozens of countries who identify as Indigenous. And for officials who have travelled the world, visiting and engaging with Indigenous and tribal communities, there are common themes, especially when it comes to racism and exclusion. Victoria Towley Corpus is a member of the Kankanai Igorot people of the Philippines. From 2014 to 2020, she was the UN's special rapporteur on the rights of indigenous peoples. She told us about the most pressing problems she's seen facing indigenous populations around the world. The key issues that indigenous peoples face are really racism and discrimination systematically entrenched in the laws or even in structures of government or even in education and media. So that has to be addressed. The other issue is the expansion, the increase in mining, oil or gas extraction, dams or even highways, huge mega projects in indigenous territories without necessarily consulting uh, indigenous peoples and getting their consent. I've seen that in Ecuador, where oil and gas extraction is happening, even in the Amazon and uh, mining companies in Asia and the Philippines, as well as in Canada or Australia and uh, even in the U.S. Yes, no, I went to the Standing Rock uh, area where oil pipelines are being built. When people across the Western world think of indigenous cultures, I think they often think of the Americas or Australia. But could you tell us a bit more about the indigenous peoples of Asia and the issues that they're facing? Well, it's a similar experience, actually, no, because uh, uh, many states wanted to believe that there, there are one nation, one state, and therefore the diverse cultures, uh, languages, and uh, even governance systems and justice systems that indigenous peoples have maintained, many of these have been uh, eroded. Uh, and of course, it's also a, a function of racism and discrimination. But the reason why you don't hear much about them is because governments don't recognize their indigenous peoples and therefore their citizenship, like for instance, the uh, ethnic minorities in Thailand, they many of them don't have citizenship and therefore they don't enjoy uh, social services. In India, they are called Adivasi and they are supposed to be included, but it's the same story. They are not given their rights. In Malaysia, they recognize indigenous peoples. In Indonesia, they also do. But again, there is also the economic projects like the setting up of agricultural plantations which encroaches in their territories, whether these are palm oil or rubber plantations. There are believed to be more than 4,000 indigenous or tribal languages spoken today. That's more than half of all known languages on Earth. But the number of fluent speakers is dwindling fast, and linguists have warned that the vast majority of these languages could be extinct by the end of this century. For hundreds of years, colonial governments tried to prevent indigenous children from learning their own languages in an effort to forcibly assimilate them into mostly white European culture. 
But in the last few decades, there's been a massive effort in Indigenous communities to restore and preserve traditional languages for a new generation, and musicians have been a vital part of that. So let's meet one of them. Rob Ruha has become a sensation, first on New Zealand's top 40 charts and then worldwide on TikTok. His songs blend Maori lyrics with modern-day pop music. He also founded the Maori youth choir Kahau, who performed with him on one of his biggest hits, 35, an ode to a coastal highway that runs through Rob Ruha's home region. Kia ora, my name's Rob Ruha. I'm from the east coast of the, the North Island of Aotearoa, New Zealand. Uh, my family uh, are a part of uh, two big tribes here on the east coast, uh, Te Whanau Apanui, which, which is where I'm living now in the tribal territories of Te Whanau Apanui. And I'm also from Ngāti Pro, um, and a whole heap of other iwis, but those are the, the tribes that, that raised me. Music in one way or another has always been a part of my family. Our family is a haka family, and a couple haka is a traditional music, I guess, of our people. And our family um, still haka today. We all still haka together in our tribal groups. In terms of uh, solo music career, I've only really been in the game for about just coming on eight years now. What I wasn't used to was international um, peoples from all around the world, the Philippines, from the States, from New York, uh, all the way over to the UK, people singing in our language because they suddenly discovered a song that they re um, resonated with. You know, we face a lot of, a lot of flack here in, in Aotearoa about the relevance of our language. Um, we've been um, shunned to say that our language isn't worth anything and our culture isn't worth any, anything. But, you know, through um, songs like 35 and, and other, other music as well that's doing really well um, on TikTok, streaming services, I mean, it's really pushing back at those things. And that actually people love cultural expression and people being themselves. As we all know, a music is an international language in itself, um, and you feel things, uh, vibrations in your body, in your soul, and in your heart before you begin to unpack the intellectual stuff uh, in music. And I think uh, through music, we have an opportunity to really engage the world in the deeper aspects of our language and in our culture, which is why I think it's important to maintain it. We have this concept in our culture called tukuiho, and tukuiho means to, you know, pass the baton on all that you have gained and all of that you have learnt to the next generation. It's, it's a part of our culture. Uh, and I'm really, really happy, <laughs> actually, um, to um, know that our kids from where we come from here on the East Coast are loving their culture. They love their language and they love to express it through music. Um, I feel I've done my job. <laughs> that's that's how I feel, and and I'm so stoked that that the world um, is embracing them, embracing them, loving who they are, um, and that they don't aspire to be anyone else but who they are. Hawaii is one of the world's favorite holiday spots, a paradise in the Pacific that draws millions of visitors each year. But that popularity is a potential threat to native Hawaiians, who've watched their ancestral lands and sacred sites be overrun by tourists. One of our listeners told us how to travel responsibly. Hello, my name is Alexa. I am native Hawaiian and Puerto Rican, I'm currently living in the occupied Hawaiian nation. Please, please do your research before traveling. Consider the impact of your visit and whether you should even go. For example, right now in Puerto Rico, uh, for the time being, as they move through the hurricane season and intermittently try to recover from it. Be respectful when you are there. Listen to locals. Don't go where you are not wanted or invited. Travel with respect. Thanks, Alexa. We'll hear more from our listeners later in the program. Brazil has just completed the first round of its presidential election. The right-wing incumbent Jair Bolsonaro will face the left-leaning former president Luis Inácio Lula da Silva in a runoff at the end of October. And one of the most contentious issues in this deeply divisive campaign has been the deforestation of the Amazon, and in particular illegal logging, 
the cutting down of trees without a permit, often on protected indigenous land. Mr Bolsonaro's government committed to ending illegal deforestation by 2028, but he has also been accused of failing to enforce environmental laws, and some indigenous groups have taken it upon themselves to defend their territory. Members of the Guajajara people in northern Brazil patrol their land with guns and traditional weapons confronting illegal loggers, many of whom are also armed. Several of these indigenous forest guardians have been killed, some of them believed to have been murdered in cold blood. Officials have said at least one logger has also died. We heard more about the forest guardians from their leader, Olimpio Guajajara. A gente tem enfrentado... We have been confronting illegal logging in indigenous territory. There's a lot of deforestation going on over there, and they're stealing many trees, and the wood that they illegally cut down is exported to other countries, or exported and then imported and sold in Brazil. So we guardians have been fighting against these environmental crimes, putting our lives at risk to defend the lungs of the planet. Now, when you're confronting these illegal loggers, what does that entail? What do you do if you find loggers on your land? Given that they're stealing the wood illegally from our territory, the first thing that we do when we find these illegal loggers is that we speak to them and we tell them to go away. But often, they don't want to listen. So the next thing we do is we take their equipment and burn it. We burn their trucks and we burn their huts and we evict them from our territory. We need to destroy everything that they're doing, all that is wrong inside our indigenous territory. And there have been reports of illegal loggers responding to that with violence and even murder. Yes, that happens. There is violence and there have been killings. We have faced this violence in the past and we continue to face it now. And I am one of the most threatened people. We have our traditional weapons, our bows, our arrows, our spears, for example, and we use those to try to intimidate the loggers. When we go out on a patrol, maybe sometimes we're 20 people, or we might be 40 people, and we are protecting more than 400,000 hectares of Amazon rainforest. Can you tell me about those threats you've faced? Have there been people saying they'll harm you personally? I've received messages directly from the illegal loggers and also from local politicians who have sent me messages telling me that I could be killed any minute. But this is the work that I've got to do. The government, the state, doesn't do its job in terms of protecting our indigenous territory. We do the government's work for them, despite the fact that several guardians have been killed. I'm giving my life for this fight and the people around the world. And that's why I'm here with this message for your listeners. We need to put an end to this destruction for the good of everybody. Now, Brazil is in the midst of an election. In the coming days, it could be Lula in charge and not Jair Bolsonaro. Would that change anything when it comes to government protection of indigenous lands from illegal logging? It's possible, né? It's possible that things could change with a new president. The Bolsonaro government outwardly declared itself an enemy of indigenous peoples, of the forest, of the water, and of land, the land which is our mother. So it's very important that we have a good dialogue with a new president. Because with President Bolsonaro, we didn't expect anything good, only the destruction and extermination of indigenous peoples. The Amazon Forest Guardian, Olympio Guajajara. Still to come in this podcast. Some of the seeds, there are no more people. Their nation is no more, but the food lived on. We'll find out how Native American farmers and chefs are reclaiming their ancestors' food and improving the health of their people. In Canada, the majority of Indigenous people live in urban centres. But many reserves, designated First Nations communities established by the colonial British and Canadian governments over the past 200 years, are in remote parts of this vast country. That means less access to education, employment, and economic development. But a handful of First Nations have been buying back parts of their traditional lands that now sit in major cities to create what they call urban reserves. The Treaty 1 nation in the province of Manitoba is preparing to build Canada's largest urban reserve on a former army barracks in the city of Winnipeg. 
It'll be called Nawe Udana, which in the Anishinaabe language means center of the community or center of the heart. Kyle Edwards is a writer and journalist from Lake Manitoba First Nation. He asked the Treaty 1 Chief Development Officer, Tim Daniels, what it means to regain control of that land. We've been locked out of the economy since the arrival of the settlers. Our movements were controlled. We had to ask for permission to leave these reserves. Quite often these reserves that were set up on purpose to be far away from civilization. And as the rest of Canada started to develop around us, you know, we, we didn't develop at the same rate. You know, we didn't have perfect roads. We didn't have the best water. We didn't have, even, even today... The digi- there was a digital divide, you know, like in my home community, you were lucky to, if your smartphone worked in my, in my community. There was, it, it was like walking into a dead zone. We're only one hour away from the, you know, the capital city of Winnipeg. Everybody else around here is developing at, at, a, at a quicker rate and benefiting from, you know, electronic commerce and all that kind of fun stuff that goes with, with technology. But here's us, not, not able to benefit from that. So that's why we're, we're buying lands in the cities to create our businesses so we could prosper from this land here in Winnipeg that we call Nawe Udana. When I lived in Winnipeg, I, I used to drive by the former barracks on my way to work pretty much like every day. You know, for a long time, it seemed dormant. It seemed like it was it was being unused. There was like sort of rumblings and rumors of it potentially one day being this urban reserve with this vibrant community. When you close your eyes and envision what Nawe Udana is going to become, what do you see? I see a, a, a vibrant community of people living there, working there, and having fun there, but at the same time recognizing our rich history that goes with that. We could build up to 3,000 homes or 3,000 residential units, and then the, you know, the rest would be uh, commercial and uh, institutional spaces, office complexes, retail spaces. You know, typically, you know, on a developer, that you'll buy a piece of land or a homeowner buys land and they, they develop their lot. In this case, our lot is not for sale, but you can enter into a long-term lease for 99 years and build your home there. This, I see the site, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's open to all, all Manitobans and all Canadians to, to live, live there, work there, play there, and shop there. I've been fortunate enough to live in, you know, urban places and cities with very rich indigenous histories, but that also today have very vibrant indigenous communities. Places like Toronto and the San Francisco Bay Area, where I currently live. But uh, I always tell people that Winnipeg is so different. Uh, You can truly feel the indigenous community in Winnipeg. And I was back home in Winnipeg recently, and uh, you just can't walk anywhere. You can't walk into a store or out in public without seeing someone that looks just like you, an Indigenous person. So I'm just wondering, like, what, what do you think this urban reserve gives to the community, the Indigenous community, from a cultural perspective? A place to call home. You know, like uh, a lot of people in our urban centres, we long for our connection to our lands, to our homelands, right? And uh, if there's a place in Winnipeg to, to connect to, you know, go, let's go, we will go there. This is a way for us to, to prosper. Not only just you know financially, but also uh, spiritually, and also um, social and our social development needs, and education, and health, and recreation, and housing, all all those things. In the African country of Botswana, the government has forced thousands of San people or bushmen from their homes in the Central Kalahari Game Reserve, claiming their hunting lifestyle is a threat to wildlife. But Kalahari territory has also become the site of commercial diamond mining. Here's what we heard from one of the Bushmen. My name is Smith. I'm a Bushman from Central Kalari Game Reserve. I was relocated from my ancestral land. We are not poachers, we are hunters. We are very good conservationists. We are people just like anybody, but we are the first people of Kalahari, the first people of this country. We want the government to respect that we have a culture that is unique and that cannot be integrated haphazardly into other, you know, cultural groups or tribes. We also heard from a listener in South Africa who said the racist classification system of apartheid continues to harm the Khoisan people. My name is Tessan. I'm from the Cape Khoi tribe that forms part of the nation known today as the Khoisan with the First Nation of Southern Africa, referred to colonially as the Hottentots, we're very much alive. 
our ancestors were put on mission stations. Apartheid forcefully classified us as coloured along with Cape Malay and mixed peoples. The New South Africa controls the narrative because we are a minority, a very vulnerable minority. We don't qualify for jobs on our own ancestral land because we're not seen as black to access black economic empowerment opportunities or support or jobs. This has led to us being displaced by the current majority, even on our ancestral lands in our historic preserve of Cape Town. We need to identify and protect members of vulnerable nations, regardless of where they find themselves in the world. The Sami people live in northern parts of Norway, Sweden, Finland, and northwest Russia. Like many of the indigenous peoples we've heard from in this podcast, their history is rife with discrimination and forced assimilation. Today, their traditional way of life, which includes semi-nomadic reindeer herding, is facing a renewed threat. As we record this podcast, a Swedish right-wing government is expected to form, which will include the Sweden Democrats, who have criticised traditional Sami practice. Our correspondent in Stockholm, Madi Savage, told us how Sweden's shifting political landscape is impacting the Sami people. Some high-profile Sweden Democrat members have previously been deeply critical of reindeer herding. And the Sweden Democrats have also reopened debates about fishing and hunting rights. Now, this is a really complicated issue, but essentially the party doesn't want Sami communities to have the power to issue licences for Swedes to fish and hunt on their land, which is something that has been granted in one Sami area and other Sami are calling for. And then I think really it's just the general sense around this party. It it does the complete opposite of promoting minority rights in terms of its tone, the way it speaks about minority groups. So there are worries about that. Although on the flip side, one Sami woman I spoke to said that although she's worried about a right-wing government with influence from the Sweden Democrats, she says at least they're clear about what they stand for. There is a sense among some Sami that other previous governments have stood up for Sami rights in public and on the international stage, but that that's not actually translated into real support and action, or at least not enough. Would you say Sami people in Sweden have a main concern? There are different concerns for different communities, and I think it's important to to iterate that. But one key thing is a huge new iron ore mine, which was recently approved near Jokmok in northern Sweden. The Sami say they're against that. They say it's not good for the environment and that it would cut through their reindeer herding routes. And there are even concerns from some Sami about a boom in renewable energies, things like wind and hydropower, which Sweden says it very much needs needs as it moves forward with its green transition to become a low carbon economy. But Sami people, a lot of them say, well, even though these are more sustainable, they would also disturb grazing land, create sounds that make reindeer feel uncomfortable and generally bring more roads and more people into Sami areas, unsettling their way of life, which they see as a very sustainable way of living. They feel that uh, they didn't create the climate crisis. Their lifestyle doesn't match that of what people have in cities and they feel that they're being unfairly punished. Punished. The other side of the story is that politicians say that new industries are needed to bring jobs to the area and renewable energy and mined materials are needed to help build Sweden's future. Let's return to the US now and hear another message from one of our listeners. Hello, my name is Murphy and I am a two-spirited Shoshone indigenous woman living in Vermont in the United States of America. I have my master's in public health from Harvard University and focus my work on storytelling as a tool for indigenous health equity. I also author a newsletter on the urgency of connecting with our ancestral wisdom to build a more just and compassionate world. We are the descendants of people who survived the end of the world as they knew it, yet here we are, we are dancing, we're having ceremony, we're supporting and protecting our communities and our planet. And indigenous creativity and everything from craft to movement to lifeways is the most inspiring transformational force. And this gives me so much hope and is something that can resonate, I think, with all colonized and formerly colonized communities. We have this belief in many indigenous communities that we are all responsible for the next seven generations after us. And I really see that as something we all hold so dear and is really motivating so much of the work and so much of the resilience that is coming out of indigenous communities of today. Indigenous food is experiencing something of a renaissance in the United States, led by native chefs, business owners and farmers who are passionate about reclaiming their culture through food. Our reporter Chelsea Bailey spoke with the owners of Awamni, an award-winning indigenous restaurant in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where Dana Thompson started by explaining how their culinary journey began. 
I didn't know what my Dakota ancestors had been eating, and he didn't know what his Lakota ancestors had been eating. So many important things come out of a question. When you walk into the restaurant Awamni, a red neon sign reminds those lucky enough to get a reservation that you are on native land. The restaurant sits on the bank of the Mississippi River, and it takes its name from the indigenous community that once lived there. Chef Sherman's modern indigenous menu boasts cedar-braised bison, grilled forest mushrooms, and a garden salad with toasted crickets. We just tried to cut out European colonial ingredients that were introduced and just really focused on the indigenous ingredients. There's no dairy or wheat flour, cane sugar, or beef pork or chicken. We prioritize purchasing ingredients from local indigenous producers first. We use three different native farms around Minneapolis, and we just buy a lot of produce from them. Centuries of colonization and forced assimilation have all but erased indigenous knowledge of native crops and food systems. But today, there's a growing movement focused on passing what remains of that knowledge to the next generation, and it starts at the root. One of the things from the colonialism that has happened was that they tried to diminish our ability to feed ourselves. That's Angela Ferguson, a farmer and a member of the Onondaga Nation. On her farm in upstate New York, Angela keeps a seed sanctuary of thousands of crops once grown by indigenous communities across North America. Some of those jars, those are the last there is on earth. As far as we know of some of those seeds, the food lived on. The seeds are still there even though the people are not. And that's pretty intense to think about. In keeping with tradition, each season, Angela and her team hold a ceremony to replant the ancient seeds that will grow and feed their community. It's like long-lost relatives coming home. And so our goal is to make sure that seven generations from now, which is, you know, the grandchildren of our great-grandchildren, will have these seeds to be able to feed their people, too. Back in Minnesota, when she's not at the restaurant, Dana is focused on using food to heal trauma through their nonprofit called Natives. These foods were systematically removed from tribal communities by the U.S. and Canadian government by design. And they use genocide, forced assimilation. That trauma is something that we hold in ourselves and in our bones and in our muscles. And so it manifests itself in all sorts of different types of inflammatory diseases. From the 1830s onwards, indigenous people were forced onto reservations, which were often unfertile lands located far away from food sources they knew. The federal government banned communities from pursuing their hunting and gathering lifestyles, and instead provided twice-monthly rations, which included foods that were new to their diets. As a result of these changes, and many Native Americans still living below the poverty line, they are now far more likely to suffer from heart disease and diabetes than any other race or ethnic group in the United States. We lost so much connection to our own foods, so it's really important that we go through this process of reclamation and redefining what are indigenous foods from these various regions and allowing indigenous peoples to have that chance to heal. That was Chef Sean Sherman. And that's all for this special Indigenous Peoples edition of the Global News Podcast. We'd love to hear your feedback. You can send us an email to globalpodcast at bbc.co.uk. You can also find us on Twitter at Global News Pod. This episode was presented and produced by Iona Hampson and Peter Goffin. The studio manager was Philip Bull, and the editor was Karen Martin. Special thanks to Isabel Rod and Charles Sanctuary. And a very special thank you to all the listeners who sent us voice messages. Until next time, goodbye.